Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Great. Okay, the uh, second and last speaker in this session is Bob Bukowski from Cornell, uh, who will be talking about the BioHPC Good afternoon. I'm going to be talking more specifically about the web service extension of the BioHPC toolset. And uh, the plan of my talk is the following. First, I'm going to explain a little bit what is CBSU, Computational Biology Service Unit, that I represent. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what BioHPC is. And these two first points will sure seem like a deja vu for those of you who attended the uh, MBF workshop yesterday. So my apologies in advance. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the actual topic of this presentation, which is the web service extension of the BioHPC system. And I'm going to describe uh, a couple of sample clients, which are still work, work in progress. And then I'm going to present uh, uh, conclusions. So first of all, computational biology service unit that I'm a member of is, uh, is one of the core facilities of the Life Scientists, uh, Sciences Core Laboratory Center at Cornell University. We live on the sixth floor of this uh, funny looking building, which is called Rhodes Hall, and it is in Ithaca, New York, on Cornell campus. Our mission is to provide bioinformatics and computational support for biological research at Cornell. We have several subgroups in our little group. We have a genomics and proteomics group who is uh, participating in cutting edge, cutting edge research, collaborating with uh, various laboratories at Cornell. We have one member specializing in systems biology, and we have a couple, uh, we, we have a few uh, people, myself included, uh, on the HPC side. And we are, uh, okay, so these are just uh, a few examples of the projects that our proteomics and genomics group is uh, uh, involved in. And I'm going to be talking too much about those projects. Uh, what I'm going to say about it is there's a one common denominator. Uh, that uh, um, binds them together. And this is the use of next generation sequencing techniques, which are generating a lot of data and require a lot of computational power to process. And we are there to actually provide this computational power. And for that purpose, we are maintaining several uh, compute clusters, which we made available not only for the projects that we are explicitly involved in, but also to a broader Cornell community, to people who uh, who need some computational power to uh, do their calculations using well-defined and uh, ready-made programs and just need the platform to run it on. And if we uh, can spare any of this power, we can actually make it available to the world as well. And the prerequisite to these last two points is to simplify access to the HPC resources, because usually uh, as it was pointed out here during keynote speeches, uh, people want to do science rather than write scripts and interface with uh, cluster schedulers and so on and so forth. So simplification of access to HPC is actually, HPC I should say, is actually a very important issue here and we accomplish this uh, task uh, with the help of our product that we have been developing for a number of years now which is called BioHPC. So let me explain now what BioHPC is. So first of all, it is a suite of open source computational biology applications which are developed by many different researchers and research groups all around the world. We collect them, install them on our clusters, make them available to pe for people to run. Sometimes we have to modify them and adapt them for efficient use in Windows HPC environments. Sometimes it requires tasks like par parallelization, for example. Another uh, aspect of BioHPC, another part I would say, which is sometimes synonymous with BioHPC, is a web-based user interface that we present to the users so that they can submit jobs through it. It's written in ASP.NET. It contains uh, job application pages, which I will uh, show you in a minute, an example of it. And it contains uh, a, a lot of job user application data management uh, uh, features as well. 
And let's look at, the, at our BioHPC web page. On the left-hand side, you can see applications that we, that we offer. So we have a lot of uh, data sequence data mining applications, including BLAST, Hammer, and InterproScan, for example. We have some alignment uh, software installed. We have a lot of population genetics programs, which actually take the majority of our CPU capabilities. We have a couple of protein modeling programs, and we recently added interfaces to Microsoft Research Biomedical applications. So the way it works is that, uh, for instance, somebody wants to run uh, BLAST, it, he or she opens the BLAST web page, fills up uh, a few answers, a few questions on the submission form, for instance, how to uh, present the query to the server, you can copy, uh, you, can, you can upload the file, you can actually paste sequences here in the FASTA format, you can select the database or databases, because we can select multiple databases to BLAST against, we can uh, uh, select some other uh, run parameters, BLAST tuning parameters, and we can click BLAST, which submits a BLAST job. So once the job is submitted, the user gets an email confirming this fact, and when the job starts executing, there's another email being sent. When the job ends, uh, the user gets another email, uh, and that's how that's how uh, he knows that uh, the job is uh, uh, completed. Uh, actually, what uh, we saw there is just the tip of the iceberg. The user just uh, interacts with the uh, web server. This web service, the, the, the web page is presented from the web server, but there is much more to that. We actually. The system actually consists of a lot of different components, and it's quite uh, complicated, both, both hardware and, and software-wise. First of all, we have to have some clusters that the jobs are running on. We have the file server to store the job's data. We have the SQL server, which is keeping track of the jobs, first of all, and second of all, is uh, storing the configuration of the whole system. Finally, we also have an FTP server for longer-term data storage. So this is all tied up into what we call uh, BioHPC uh, interface. It, uh, uh, the good news is, although it looks uh, kind of complicated, the good news is is that actually uh, uh, all of these uh, or most of these functions can be performed by just one single uh, server. So, for example, SQL Server, Web Server, File Server, NFTP Server, if you wish, they can all be just one physically just one machine. For example, the head node of a cluster. So, for smaller installations, uh, this kind of strategy will work as well. BioHPC is an open source project. We have an installation package available at this link here, biohpc.org. This is not a point and click installation simply because there is a lot of elements involved in it. Uh, we have several installations of the system running, our primary CBSU installation and a couple of other ones as well. Uh, a little bit of statistics of BioHPC usage. Uh, this plot kind of illustrates in terms of uh, CPU time uh, the usage of, uh, of the system, we can see that it's growing kind of consistently over the years. The plot also shows the um, um, distribution of the CPU time between different types of applications. You can see that population genetics is the most uh, uh, time-consuming part here, followed by the protein structure prediction and, the, and what is called here sequence analysis, which basically means blast runs, mostly. We have uh, about 3,500 uh, unique users worldwide. I think we calculated recently that they come from 88 uh, countries. Uh, the total number of countries actually in the world is 192, which makes it almost 50%. Most of, the, most of these users come from the United States. This is followed closely by France and Canada and many other countries. So um, why do we want to expose BioHPC as a web service? Well, first of all, um, we could, uh, if we do that, we could free ourselves from a web browser as a primary interface to the system. So we can write, uh, if we have a web service, we can write uh, clients in any, uh, on any platform that we, the, that we wish, for example, Microsoft Excel. 
And in many cases, it would be beneficial for, for, the, for the applications because uh, uh, if, you, if we can submit a job from a client like this and then, and then uh, uh, download a result, this result could be easily visualized immediately using Excel tools, for example. And I'm going to show a little example of that later on. Uh, second, we would like to incorporate HPC applications and automated analysis pipelines, which is especially important in the context of the next generation sequencing pipelines, which we are now working on. And uh, um, thirdly, it would make uh, exposing BioHBC as a web service would make it uh, available through Microsoft Biology, Funda found, uh, Microsoft Biology Foundation, which could become sort of a client to the HPC resources, and in particular, it could benefit from BioHPC, since uh, we have a lot of uh, population genetics applications involved in our system, which are not represented in the MBF yet. So there's a few factors to, to consider when we uh, want to, when we're thinking about the a, a web service uh, by HPC web service. So first of all, we have a wide variety of applications, 38 right now, which are doing different things. They are accepting different input and producing really different output. We want to make the system universal enough to, to kind of serve all these applications. Uh, the second point, probably the most important point here, is that many of these applications are talking to the user in terms of files. So their input to them is a lot of files. Sometimes these files may be large, several gigabytes even. And the output from these applications can also be multiple files, and some of them also may be large. So we are facing the problem of file staging here, which kind of dictates how the, the job submission process um, has to be implemented. Well, first we have to have to uh, first, we have to allocate the job, which will kind of define the space for it, for example, on our file server to, to store the files in. Once the job is allocated, we can actually stage the input files, then we can submit the job. So it's just not, not one command anymore, it has, kind of has to be three commands, really, uh, that um, make up this uh, job submission uh, process. The last point to consider, which is uh, more of a point for uh, a client rather than the web service itself is that most of our jobs are not taking seconds or minutes. They are taking days. Sometimes they are taking weeks. So the, the issue is that the user has to be able to come back and using his client, he has to be able to come back to the jobs that he submitted days ago. So with these, uh, all these factors in mind, we uh, implemented our web service. We wrote it in ASP.NET. The uh, link to the ASMX uh, file is where you can find this web service. Now on the client side, we uh, wrote, um, basically we, 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 we are uh, uh, making available a file containing this BioHPC web service client namespace, which is basically containing the service proxy class with all the web methods and, and structures which the service exports and also a couple of additional wrapper functions for, for file staging. This, is, uh, this file is uh, often updated because we are still adapting new applications uh, to the web service, so some more data structures are being, are, are being exported. Uh, you can actually try it out, the, the, the current version of it. This is the, the second link here is the link to a zip file containing a very simple uh, command line application in the form of the Visual Studio 2008 solution which illustrates how to how to use the service and also a Word document and PDF document I believe also with the description uh, of the service. So uh, in a nutshell what we have here the most important objects exported by the service is this uh, class called app input data which contains essentially data structures uh, uh, that the user has to fill out in order to, to submit an application. It contains some application-specific uh, substructures, let's say. And it uh, exports a class called BioHPC client, which contains the actual web methods used for submitting a job. And these, these are uh, kind of listed here more or less in the order that they would be used in a, in a client. So first we have to create a job, and we need to specify what kind of application uh, uh, we, uh, we, we want to run, so this first parameter, app ID, uh, 
tells the service just that. We need to specify the job name, number of nodes to run it on. We also need to specify an email because we always want to keep track of the users who use our system and the password. Password is actually optional. We can specify it or leave it, uh, leave it empty. Uh, uh, our registered users enjoy, who have the password actually, they enjoy a little bit more privileges than the guest users. They enjoy longer timeouts, for example. And also they have, can have access to applications that the guest users don't have access to. So after the job is created, we can actually initialize the input data uh, to the to defaults, and this is also a web service function. After that is done, we can upload the input file. And again, uh, you can see that, for example, the function upload input file, it takes the job ID and control number. These two things define a job. Job ID is just a consecutive uh, uh, number of the job generated by the SQL server, so this is not a mystery to anybody. It's not secret. But the con control number is like a random... Uh, a random integer number which serves as a sort of a password to the job's resources. So you have to have these two and they have to match in order for you to be able to access, access the job files, for example. So upload file, after the file is uploaded, we can submit the job, then we can check the status of the job using the get job info function. We can cancel, cancel the job if we want to. And finally, when the job is finished, we can download uh, the um, output files using this download file function, possibly multiple times, depending on how many output files our job uh, generated. Sometimes jo a job generates a simple output file, like a main output file, which we would rather have as a string, retrieved as a string, than as a file. And then uh, um, there's another function made available here, get output a string, which can be used for this purpose. Here's a programming example. I don't want to spend too much time on it because it uh, sort of follows what's in the demo client. The link um, to this client is repeated here on this, uh, on this page. So um, clients. So as I said, clients are kind of work in progress right now. First of all, because not all of the BioHPC applications are exposed as a web service yet. Uh, and I've already talked about the simple command line demo client. We also have a couple of Excel clients to show you, also in the, the early stages of development, but probably we're showing already. So first I'm going to show the native CBSU client that uh, we have been developing here. We have the uh, BioHPC Tools tab. And after pressing the tab, this set of buttons come, come up here. So the first thing to do would be to log in. Going to log in as myself. And once we log in, we, can, we have uh, access to uh, different uh, uh, job submission clients. So for example, here in the uh, group sequence analysis, what we implemented so far is Blast, Hammer, and, uh, and Interpro Scan. We also have one application so far exposed as a web service from MSR Research, which is Create Epitome. Uh, what I wanted to show you is an application call, called MDiv. This is uh, was one of the population genetics applications. What it does is kind of trying to estimate the, the, the various parameters in the scenario where you have two populations uh, diverging from one ancestral, ancestral population with uh, uh, some migration taking place in between. And, uh, uh, well, it, it's basically it's a Monte Carlo simulation. It may be, may be lengthy, uh, but uh, this form here kind of illustrates how a job can be submitted. We just uh, uh, select a data file, which contains basically some sequence data that this simulation is based on. Uh, some default parameters are already filled up here. Just can click Submit. What it does right now, it's trying to upload the file. And it did that, and the file has been successfully uploaded. Now we can use a little tool, Show Jobs here. It's like a job administrator. Pretty much we can select what kind of application we want to see here. So I'm going to select MDiv because this is what I submitted. And I can see 
several MDIF jobs here, including this last one, which is queued. So it probably gonna, it's probably going to remain queued for a while because this is working on the live system. It, it's probably backed up a little bit, so it's not going to execute immediately. But uh, as you probably can expect, I have some ready-made results here <laughs> from similar jobs. For example, this job finished before, and I can, by clicking on the show output files, I can see what kind of files this job produced. For some reason, it's not displaying here with this resolution. As I said, this is a work in progress. What you should see here is the sizes of those files. So for example, I can select any number of files that I want, and I can try to download them. This is uh, letting me select the uh, directory to download it into. An alternative would be to import the main file directly into Excel, which uh, results in immediate visual analysis of those results. The results that the program returns happen to be in this numerical form, basically. And, uh, and what it is, that they, they are uh, posterior probability distributions of different parameters. And these, of course, can be plotted. So I can do it automatically here in Excel, create the plots. So this is uh, basically the direction that, that our native CBSU interface uh, is, uh, client, uh, Excel client is going into. Now, you can see another tab here, which is called bioinformatics. And uh, for those of you who attended the MBF workshop yesterday, it should be familiar because uh, this takes you to the MBF Excel client, pretty much. And what I wanted to show you here is that the BLAST web service from BioHPC is actually implemented in MBF already. You can basically fetch the database names here. They will change when I change the BLAST program to run. Uh, essentially, we kind of treat this uh, little interface as the beginning of our collaboration with the MBF team. And eventually, uh, I think the goal would be to make the BioHPC bio interface, this BioHPC tools kind of being merged with the, with the MBF tool eventually. So this uh, is actually all I wanted to uh, tell you about it. Basically, conclusions are the following. The core of the BioHPC web service has, be, has been developed. We have uh, some applications already exposed as a web services, and we are working on adding others. We have our BLAST web service integrated with Microsoft Biology Foundation. We have our comprehensive Excel client under, under development, and the demo project can be downloaded from this link. And finally, I wanted to acknowledge funding from Microsoft Research, and before that, we enjoyed relationship with Microsoft as one of the HPC institutes. And we also want to thank Microsoft MBF team for fruitful collaboration. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, there is a question right there. Uh, okay, so we, um, the, the BioHPC uh, interfaces with the cluster scheduler. So we work with the HPC 2008 and CCS cluster. So basically when we submit a job to the cluster, we submit the job to the schedulers. So basically that's, uh, that's it. We do not uh, really have any priority based scheduling implemented uh, at this point. So basically the cluster scheduler itself takes care of it. From the... It kind of depends because the usage varies widely by time. So sometimes the cluster are, clusters are almost empty and then your job goes in immediately. And sometimes you have to wait for a couple of days, for example, to get in. It kind of depends what jobs are run and what kind of jobs are run.
and it does actually. It's actually running, you can see it's running. Well, actually, you would really like to see the bio HPC, uh, not bio HPC, sorry, HPC basic profile. You'd like to see it supporting uh, multitask jobs, for example. It doesn't support that yet. For the, that's, that's one thing. Yeah. Especially the new one, especially that you can submit a multitask job, and these tasks are actually dynamically assigned, and the resources are dynamically assigned. So right now the situation is that remote clusters uh, do not support the same features of the scheduler as the local clusters, simply because bio, the, this HPC basic profile does not support that. So this is what we would like. We kind of uh, yeah, we would like to see that uh, done definitely. Or we would have to ask the operators of these remote clusters to install our version of the submission web server, which they may or may not want to to do. Right now it's 38, last time I counted. It's 38 programs, actually. 
uh, show them again. Here is the list on the left hand side. I need to show all and scroll. Well, first of all, they are kind of grouped into several groups. So we can sequence on have sequence analysis, we have alignment, population genetics, protein structure, and so on. When we expand that, you can see the details, what kind of programs exactly we are offering. So the, the, there is a few programs that you mm, all know. It's BLAST and Hammer and Interproscan. The P in front of this means that they are parallelized. So they run, we utilize many cores to, to run those jobs on uh, a multi-sequence query. And there are some others which also serve the purpose of analyzing the sequence in a broad sense. We have population genetics programs here. Right. We have uh, a couple of protein structure prediction programs. One of them, Loop, is actually very popular and kind of uh, takes uh, second place as when it comes to CPU consumption. This is a good question. Uh, I would say that most of, the, uh, okay, most of these programs, uh, yeah, it, 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 it depends on, on what kind of uh, program group you are, you are talking about. For example, Blast, Hammer, Interproscan, we know that we can run them somewhere else. For example, NCBI, we can run Blast, right? Interproscan, we can run also through, web through their websites or even web services. So, um, so these are, of course, not, not unique. Some of them are unique. For example, this Gimson program, this is a locally developed program by Cornell researchers, and it's available only here. Of course, Clastal W, Tea Coffee, they have other uh, sites where you can run it. Stretcher, I'm not sure. This is just a pairwise alignment program. I don't know if you can run it uh, uh, on the web anywhere else. I know that these population genetics programs are completely unique. You cannot, you cannot run it on the web anywhere else. You can download the executables, and you can run it on your own laptop if you want, because they are all open source applications which are distributed freely. But if, you, but if your laptop is backed up with stuff, then you don't, you, you don't want to run it there. By popular demand, pretty much. So essentially, um, we interact with our users, and once in a while we get a request. Hey, can you, you know, I have this program here. I would really like to run it because I have uh, some data to analyze with this program. And uh, I need some computational power. Can you just install it for me? And we get uh, uh, inquiries. So what's your question? Who's paying for it? Okay. Yeah. And Cornell, Cornell users, let me mention that Cornell users have priority here. They can be registered, they can run more jobs, and they can run jobs longer.
Yeah, that's in the plans. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, sadly we're out of time for this session, but it sounds like you've got some uh, topics of conversation for the coffee break as well. So please join me in thanking all the speakers.